Welcome to the Waiting Warriors podcast. As loved ones of first responders and military personnel, we often face life situations and challenges that many others don't experience. And while each of us and our experiences are unique, together we can learn from one another and become stronger in this journey of life. Now let's step out of mediocrity. It's time to thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome again to The Waiting Warriors. I have one of my really good friends. I'm very excited about this. Um, This is Mindy Holmgren. So welcome, Mindy. Hey, I'm so excited to be here. I'm also slightly nervous. I've been drinking a lot of water. So hopefully I don't have to have like a potty break in the middle of this. I feel like my (laughs) mouth is still dry. (laughs) You have to pause and go to the bathroom. (laughs) That'll be be great. It's okay. We can edit that. It's not like there will be a like awkward minute, minute and a half to strand in the podcast. That'd be funny to do though. Um. Okay, guys. I first of all, I love Mindy, and you guys will all love her too. She is so sweet. Um, I got the privilege of meeting her. How long has it? It's been um, a few years. Couple, yeah, a couple of years. So her husband also is a chaplain. I don't know if I, yeah, I've said that in previous episodes. Um, that my husband's a chaplain, and for our church, each year we have in, an endorsement conference. So the chaplains and all their wives get together, and it is a blast. And I love all those women, and Mindy is one of them. We actually live in the same area right now, so we get to have play dates and everything, and it's awesome. Yeah. So, Mindy, let's start out with, tell us kind of what's your deal right now. How many kids? What does your husband do? All that jazz. Okay, yeah. So, uh, my husband is Corey. He is in the Army National Guard and is a chaplain. Um, He, let's see, so we have three kids. We have been married for 11 years, a little over 11 years. Um, It'll be 12 this year. Um, It's funny because I actually married an Air Force cadet who was like a political science slash international studies major. And I was a music therapy major at the time. And then um, He's very different now. He is not in the Air Force. He is in the Army. I did not graduate in music therapy. And um, he's a therapist, actually. So um, just because we're in the National Guard, he's really a chaplain for the drill weekend, but he still has a civilian job. And he is a marriage and family therapist. Um, He actually specializes in pornography and sexual addiction recovery. So that is something that we both kind of do. We have three kids. Our oldest is 10. Um, The next will be seven next week. And um, then our youngest is four. Boy, girl, girl. Um, So, yeah, I um, did not think that we would be in this military life forever because I thought he was going to basically go active duty to pay back for the school that they were paying for when we got married. And um, then everything changed when he decided he wanted to be a chaplain. And then at the time the air force told him that they didn't need chaplains. And so he's like, okay, well I'm going army then. So he joined the national guard was in the ROTC program. And then um, after he commissioned as an officer, Um, and finished his bachelor's degree, he went on to get um, two masters. That's, there's a lot of school to be a chaplain, but um, things are really going really good. He loves being a chaplain and I love, um, I love being a military family. I love being an army wife. I love meeting other army wives and um, other, just even military families. I love serving them and, um, you know, being there for them. Yeah. I think it's funny. Like I'm even starting to feel it more for just first responders wives, which is why I included them in this podcast because right now Austin works at a hospital. So we are interacting a lot with EMTs and late night nurses and firefighters and policemen and all that kind of stuff. So 
it's funny though, like when you meet somebody, there's just an instant connection. Absolutely, It's not hard. And sometimes I wonder, especially in the military, I wonder if it's because we know we don't have time to waste where it's like, okay, we should just become friends right now today because who knows when we'll be moving. <laughs> no, it's, you know, cause, um, with my husband being a therapist, he doesn't only service soldiers. If he was a full-time chaplain, he has a whole variety of clients, but there are some people that do want to talk to him because he's military and they are military. And, um, there's just this underlying, like, you get it. If he talks, you, yeah. like you understand, you can talk and talk. Well, this happened, this happened, this happened. But unless you are truly in the military for him and his clients, at least, you know, it's, it's just not the same. And I feel that way about other, other army wives like myself or other military families. Yeah. Okay. Let's, you started talking a little bit about your guys's kind of journey, but, um, let's just go into kind of your story and why we're here. I would really love to hear your perspective on patience because I know, like you had said, you guys were going on a very different path. And then not only did you switch paths, so things are very different than you expected, but it took a long time, right? Yes, um, it did. So when, um, Deciding when my husband decided he wanted to be a chaplain, that wasn't a super, it was kind of hard at the time, but it wasn't, it wasn't a crazy hard decision. It just kind of fit. But then after that was when um, I kind of realized that being this military wife and having a, a career in music therapy probably wasn't going to work for me. And so I ended up doing something else. But then when um, Corey was started his graduate school program. Um, sometimes the army is really good about making lots of changes and things kept changing. Requirements kept changing. Um, the time just kept changing. And so what started as, yeah, this should be a couple of years um, mm -hmm. turned into, okay, it'll be a couple more years now. And then a couple more years now. And then a couple more years now, he actually started at a whole different school. Um, it was an online program, but it was, uh, cause we were living in Utah and it was this school that was in Texas. Um, and it was not a good fit for him. He actually failed most of his classes and the ones he did pass did not transfer to the new school that he started a year later. So that was an entire year completely wasted, um, wasted money, wasted time. Um, so he started a new program at a different school. It was online again, um, but it was a way better fit for him and his personality and the teachers that he had and the classes he could take um, then he went to chaplain school, which is just a three-month sort of chaplain training that the Army requires. Um, and he was introduced to therapy there and realized that he actually really loved this concept of marriage therapy, family therapy. Um, and then as they studied a little bit more at chaplain school, he realized that he kind of had a knack for this. So then when he came home from chaplain school, he told me that he also wanted to get a master's in marriage and family therapy. So he had to get a master's in divinity. That's what was what's required of the army to be a chaplain. Um, and then he wanted to get a master's in marriage and family therapy as well. Knowing that we would be in the National Guard, he needed a civilian job. And um, it, but it would also help him in its chaplain role to be able to provide support to his soldiers. So it, it did really kind of go together really well, but it of course just added on more time and more time. And so um, of the 11 years that we've been married, we were college students for nine of them. And that was really frustrating. It kind of felt like I would never get to the light at the end of the tunnel. Like it just kept going further and we'd be almost there. I'd be thinking that, you know, would be approaching it and then something would happen and would change and it would get further down the line. So 
that part was really hard. I continually felt like I was just kind of stuck in this loop of being um, poor and being stressed and not having time to do things. Um, We moved into a motel job. We were motel managers and it was a live-in position. We did that job for almost four years. It was kind of the best, worst job we've ever had. (laughs) Um, It was, it was perfect for him to do his online school. Um, It worked out really well for that. Um, But it was also a really hard job because you're essentially working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So everything you do gets interrupted. You've got phone calls and people checking in and maids having questions and helping a customer with something in their room. So it was, it was hard to have what I had, you know, this normal life, this normal family life idea in my head. And it was hard for me to ever feel like I could attain that because of this lifestyle that we had with our job. And so I felt stuck with that. I felt stuck that we couldn't leave. Like someone always had to be watching the office And then there was this school thing that just kept getting extended and extended and extended. Um, And then when it was time for Corey to do his internship for his therapy masters, um, he, he found his dream internship. It was where he still works. He was hired on afterwards. Um, But we had to move into my parents' house to live with my parents for two years. So after feeling stuck for four years at the motel, I, I still honestly felt kind of stuck living with my family, with my parents. Um, yeah, it was sort of, um, yeah, I tried to keep a perspective of we are moving forward, but it really just felt like we kept taking sideways steps and never really going anywhere. So it was, I was pregnant with my third child when we moved in with my parents, Um, I had her, you know, while we were living there. So the whole thing just, again, I was always trying to reach or trying to have this like perfect, normal family life. And, and all these things kept happening that it felt like we couldn't reach that. And, um, my frustrations, um, just sort of got the better of me. I definitely got into, um, a down and depressive state because I sort of was playing this victim role of um, my life is so hard and this is taking so long and, you know, blah, 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 on and on with those just like this stinks kind of a thing. Um, There's nothing. I can, there's nothing. Yeah. I can just, just stuck. Like I just can't think of a, of a different way. I just feel really stuck. Um, and so, yeah, so patience absolutely has been something that for some reason I have just continually been needing to learn (laughs) and, um, even, even after we moved out of my parents' house, we weren't completely out of the woods yet. There was still one more year of college. Let's see, was it a year? No, it was like six months, maybe six months left before school was totally done. And um, then it was, you know, starting at the bottom of the totem pole in his therapy practice, um, trying to build clients and and get enough work to earn enough money to support a family. So again, like here, finally, this dumb long road of school was over And I still felt like I needed to practice patience because we had to wait until it felt like we could function financially with um, this job that he was basically starting from scratch. Um, So, yeah, for basically our entire marriage, there has been just this giant lesson of patience and um, to try to kind of figure out what my role in this all really is. Um, So that sort of lesson that I have learned with patients in our, 
in our kind of journey of school and work has kind of spilled over into my parenting style as well. Um, how I just sort of feel like I am a much more patient mother now than I was when I had just one 18 month old and I was living in the motel. I remember a couple of times just being so frustrated because I'd have my son in timeout for something, something that had happened. And then someone would come into the office and I'd have to leave him in timeout to go help this person in the office. I'd come back and he'd of course, didn't stay yeah. sitting there. <laughs> and so yeah. I come back and he's running around doing something else. And I would be just so frustrated that I had missed that teaching opportunity and feeling like he's not going to turn out like a good kid, you know, because I, because I didn't, I need to teach him like this, this and this. And I, and I missed my opportunity and um, he's 10 now and he is still a really good kid despite <laughs> Despite all my mistakes is, yeah, as this impatient, expecting perfection kind of, kind of a mother back then. So being just a, a little, like just a smidge more easygoing. I'm not, I'm not some crazy uh, free thinker. It, I'm finding my perfect balance between knowing what's expected of them and having responsibilities and you know, correct behavior at correct times, but, um, also, also letting them be themselves and realizing that they're just kids and using opportunities to just teach more than control. And, um, that, so that has, it's kind of just almost all spilled together. Yeah. I am a firm believer that if you pray to God or universe or whatever, and you ask for an attribute, you don't just like, it is not just poured upon you. Now you are a patient person. Now you are kinder or now whatever it is, you just get tried a lot and patience is tested. Yes, that is absolutely true. Absolutely true. Because, I mean, this has been years in the making, virtually our entire marriage, you know, and I don't want to say that like I've arrived, like I am a patient person now. (laughs) It's not like you can just be, you know, perfect in anything. And, but there just are some things that I have learned from these experiences that has um, kind of led me to just be more patient and loving in all of my interactions with everybody kind of trying to understand like this person has a story that I know nothing about. They have things going on in their lives that I know nothing about. And so, however, you know, if they're treating me bad or something at this time, it's really probably not me. It's really probably something with them and trying to let that kind of roll off Mm -hmm. your back. Cause, um, I don't know, being patient and, and being loving is kind of synonymous to me. And so if you are just being more loving to whoever it is that you're interacting with, then you're automatically going to be more patient. Um, you're going to automatically just have more of those, those positive qualities that I, I do try to um, work toward. So, yeah, I like that. Um, so what are three things that you think people can do that they can do to be more patient? So one thing is breathing for sure. (laughs) Um, when you get to that, like overwhelmed stage, like let's just use kids for example, because I'm mostly a stay at home mom and there's kids around me, you know, all the time. So let's say that my kids are doing something, um, taking a deep breath or even a few deep breaths before you just blurt out some kind of a yelling, stop it type phrase. Um, Taking a few deep breaths will help you to calm down, get your thoughts in order. Uh, that That kind of a practice has helped me a lot. Just literally taking a couple of deep breaths. Um, something else, and I did, I did kind of already mention this, you know, before, but, um, 
concentrating on being more loving. If love yeah. is the driving force be- be- behind your actions and your thoughts and your words, um, then you will automatically be more patient. You will yell less. You will be kinder to those around you. Um, you will be more calm in, in everything that you do. At least that is how it has been for me. And so um, sometimes you just have to kind of have that mindset of loving this person and having that love be the driving force behind your actions or your thoughts or your words or, or whatever it is. And I think that even goes towards being patient with yourself and being patient with yeah. the situation. Like you said before that you got in this deep funk and everything because you were in that victim state, but a victim comes from a place of mm-hmm. limitations and of fear and the opposite of fear is really love. So if you are just approaching it with, right. I mean, I'm not saying that nothing bad ever happens and you know, when bad things happen that we should just love it. But, but when you approach things from that place of love, not necessarily positivity, but of love, then it does change things and you're able to be more patient with yes, the circumstances yeah, absolutely. With yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if I was to say one more thing for my third suggestion would be to listen. Sometimes you approach a situation um, and your automatic instinct is to react maybe with anger or yelling or something like that. But if you take a step back to listen to what is going on, you might be able to eliminate some, what some kind of confrontation um, that would that would come up. Um, there's a cute story that I remember reading a long time ago, and I like using this in, as an example. Um, a mom walks in the kitchen to her child, um, dumping the box of cereal out over a bowl, but it's all over the counter now. And so automatically it's, I mean, I, you know, have to stop myself. It's like, what are you doing? Like, why are you making a big mess? Or why are you letting that spill? You know, all of those kinds of um, persecutor type phrases. And instead of doing that, just asking what happened or something like that. And then, so this mom says, what happened? And the child says, well, I was trying to get so-and-so who was a sibling, a bowl of cereal because they don't feel good. And the cereal just kept coming. And um, in the like innocence of a child, I love that phrase. Like they were trying to do something nice and did not understand how to stop the cereal from coming out of the box or, 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 you know, whatever it is. And so taking that time to listen to that person's explanation, then it doesn't turn into a fight or making someone cry because they made a mistake, then it turns into this, well, let me help you. Let's do this together. If you pick the box up, then the cereal stops, you know? <laughs> um, and so by taking taking a few minutes to listen, and I have felt like I have had moments like this with my own kids, instead of getting angry or something like that, asking what is wrong, letting them talk, And then instead of trying to automatically maybe fix the problem or um, talk to them about whatever is going on, just keep asking questions like, and what else? And what else? And what about that? And how did that make you feel? I mean, I'm kind of turning into a therapist now. Like, how did that make you feel? But (laughs) I am married to one, and so I can't help it. (laughs) Really parenting is it really should be just a big therapy session for you. <laughs> um, yes, but listening is something that I have not always been been good at, but I am learning the importance of it. Yeah. Oh man, guys, this is why I like hanging out with Mindy. <laughs> because I'll be honest, I have struggled the past few days with being um with being patient. I am just working 
on a lot of projects right now and it was the deadlines and like yesterday was actually when this podcast launched the first three episodes and I thought that was just going to be a simple click of the button and it turned into this four hour ordeal and anyways things have been stressful and I have been short with my kids and I not and now that I say that out loud I think it's interesting that the phrase is we're being short with them because we're not being patient yeah and patience time and it it does it requires that long listening huh that's interesting I never I love that yeah but but yeah, this is, if nothing else, if no one else gets anything out of it, this has been very helpful for me. <laughs> I'm going to try and just take some deep breaths before everything happens because we have a lot of spilt cereal <laughs> in our house. <laughs> um, the and yeah, <laughs> something about that box. It just keeps coming. I don't know. How do you stop yeah. it? <laughs> but it's funny because more times, more often than not, it is because they're trying to do something. Yeah. What, you know, it, it's not always this like super sweet moment, but it's they're just trying to accomplish something. And if we, you know, and it's even with adults, when you think about it, like when you just go into a demeaning, why are you doing that? It, I think it really just discourages people because it's like, we were just trying to do something good. Yeah. But, but we as the accuser, I'll say, we just, we don't know their point of view. So. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I wasn't always in a healthy mindset to even want to try to be patient. And if you, if any of the listeners are also in that mindset, that's okay. Cause I have been there too, where you're just like in survival mode and can't think about anything, but making it through the day, maybe not killing the kids or <laughs> like whatever it is that's on your plate. You're just kind of in that survival mode. Like I've, I've been there too. And um, the only thing that really worked that really helped me is um, kind of letting go of the darkness that I'd let surround my heart and allow light to come back into my life and, um, I love the imagery of a candle lighting a candle and, you know, it doesn't diminish the first candle's light at all to share its light. But I was, I have been in the mindset of how can I share my light if my light is already so dim? And um, so, you know, if that's where you are, that is just fine that's a sacred space because once you like when you reach rock bottom, that's when you actually turn to whatever power it is that you believe in and allow that power to work within you to lift you up again. I mean, it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard to reach that place. It's hard to let yourself, you know, be okay with being on the bottom, but, um, that's when you get to reach out to others um, yeah. to have them help lift you. And, and for me, letting light back in, which ultimately ended up being love, letting others love me and letting myself love myself. And then that, that love just kind of kept growing and I could share that love again with others. Oh man, guys, this is good stuff. And if I think the last thing I want to say is just if you are in that place, because I I think I've been there. We'll see if I hit an even deeper bottom. But but if you are there, like just be patient with yourself and just start with breathing. Like I I love that that was your number one. Just start with breathing, whether that is figuratively or literally. Just when you are overwhelmed and everything just stinks, just breathe and just start with that. And if that's all you do to help yourself and try and get out of it, then that's fine for day one, you know, or day 15. If that's what you do for 15 days to try and get out of it, because it does, it takes time. So thank you, Mindy. I pretty sure we could go on forever and maybe I'll just have you on the podcast again sometime. (laughs) 
Okay, well, I have thoroughly enjoyed this. And Mindy, if anybody wants to reach out and connect to you, where can they um, find you? Um, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook. I have um, an Instagram page. It's Oils with Mindy. I love and teach about doTERRA essential oils. So you can find me at Oils with Mindy. And that is also the name of my Facebook page. So either Instagram or Facebook, Oils with Mindy. And if anybody wants to reach out, I would love to chat with you. Okay, awesome. Thanks everybody for listening. And we'll see you another day on The Waiting Warriors. Bye. Hey everyone, I have a favor to ask. If you have enjoyed this podcast, can you leave a review and subscribe? I promise it just takes a second and that will help more people find this podcast. Also, I'd love for you to join us in our Facebook group. Just go to facebook.com slash The Waiting Warrior, click groups, and then The Waiting Warriors. Until next time, have an awesome day.